Carmen, this is your favorite dress. You have to come home and wear it. Come back and dress it. Please, please, my daughter. Oh, my family, my family. These are the words of a mourning mother whose 13-year-old daughter was kidnapped by Australia's worst serial killer. Between 1987 and 1991, a masked attacker known only as Mr. Cruel broke into homes, found the parents, and disappeared with one of their children, usually the daughter of the family. The little girls would be subjected to the worst treatment possible. What makes this so much worse is that he was never caught, even though most of his victims survived. Let's take a look at the case that still haunts Australia. On August 22, 1987, at 4 in the morning, an urban legend began to take form, in the shape of a masked man lurking outside of a family home. Removing a pane of glass from the family's living room window, this criminal made his way inside, alerting absolutely no one. He snuck into the bedroom of the parents, armed with a knife and a gun. He woke up the two parents under the threat of lethal retaliation, pretending to just be a common thief that was interested in their personal belongings. He blindfolded and gagged each with surgical tape before putting them in the wardrobe. Then he made his way to the rest of the house. Over the next two hours, this masked intruder would take breaks from his own perverted sexual desires to wander throughout the family's home, even stopping at one point to make himself a meal. After spending the better part of two hours sexually assaulting and abusing this poor 11-year-old girl, this mysterious psychopath left the house with a box of classic records and a blue jacket stolen from the family. This is how the legend of Mr. Cruel began, an established an Australian boogeyman that would haunt parents and children for decades afterwards. The little girl was eventually able to tell police that the intruder used the family phone to call someone else during one of his breaks in attacking her. From what the girl heard, this call was a threatening one, with the man demanding the person on the other end of the line to move their children or they would be next, and he referred to the unknown person as Bozo. Police then checked the family's phone records, but there was no record of this call whatsoever. It would later become clear that this was Mr. Cruel planting a misleading clue to purposefully confuse investigators. He would successfully throw off his scent for years. This was just the start of Mr. Cruel, who had perfected the art of breaking in and assaulting. The mystery clean freak's brazen attacks were so meticulously planned and committed in such a calculated fashion, he was initially known as Mr. Cool. None of his surviving victims ever saw Mr. Cruel's face, which was hidden by a chilling black balaclava with white stitching around the eyes and mouth. Mr. Cruel knew everything about the families he traumatized, as detectives believed he would stake out his victims for weeks or even months ahead of time, learning their habits and movements. A year after the first one, Mr. Cruel struck again. Just days after Christmas in 1988, John Wills, his wife, and their four daughters were fast asleep in their Ringwood area home, a couple of miles southeast of where the previous crimes had taken place. Wearing dark blue overalls and a dark ski mask, Mr. Cruel broke into the Will's home and held a gun to John Will's head. As before, he clutched a knife in his other hand and told the parents to roll onto their stomachs. Then he bound and gagged them. After cutting the phone lines, he went into the bedroom where Will's four daughters all slept. What's crazy is he addressed the 10-year-old Sharon Wills by name. He quickly woke her up, blindfolded and gagged her, then picked up a few items of her clothing and fled the house with her early the next morning. Yes, this time he took the girl with him. A note written in large, bold letters was found on Phyllis Chan's Toyota Camry shortly after the abduction. It read, Pay back, Asian drug dealer. More, more to come. But after combing John Chan's background, this provided to be just another one of Mr. Cruel's red herrings. 18 hours later, a woman stumbled upon a tiny figure standing on a street corner just after midnight. Dressed in green garbage bags, it was Sharon Wills. As Sharon Wills was reunited with her family, she gave police some startling clues as to who her attacker could be. Because Wills was blindfolded through her assault, she could not give a full description of Mr. Cruel. But she did recall how shortly before letting her go, the suspect made sure to give her a thorough bath. He not only washed off any forensic evidence he had left behind, but also clipped her fingernails and toenails, and brushed and flossed her teeth. 
Investigators quickly tie this incident to the previous one in Lower Plenty, and a domain of fear and apprehension was beginning to take shape in the Melbourne suburbs. Mr. Cruel struck a third time on July 3, 1990, in the suburb of Canterbury, Victoria. Here resided the rich Linus family, who have been renting a house along the prestigious Monomeath Avenue. This distinguished neighborhood had been home to plenty of Australian politicians and public officials in its time, making it a secure area to live in, or so many believed. That night, the parents weren't home, and 15-year-old Fiona and 13-year-old Nicola were woken by the ranting, commanding orders of a masked intruder. Armed with his usual gun and knife, he instructed Nicola to go into another room to pick up her Presbyterian Ladies College School uniform while he tied Fiona to her bed. Mr. Cruel drove about half a mile down the road with Nicola, parked and then transferred to another vehicle. Just a few days later, Nicola was dropped off at an electricity station, not far from her home. She was fully dressed, wrapped in a blanket, and still blindfolded. Nicola told the police that Mr. Cruel was about 5 foot 8 and possibly had reddish brown hair. Some details of her ordeal were more terrifying. She revealed that she was forced to lay down into a neck brace contraption fastened to the abductor's bed throughout her time in captivity, restraining her while she was abused for 50 hours straight. His final victim was 13-year-old Carmine Chan. He hit the home when the parents weren't there. He told Chan and her younger sister he just wanted money before he abducted Carmine. By the time the police arrived, they knew what to expect. They'd been to enough of Mr. Cruel's crime scenes to know what had taken place. But unlike other girls, Carmine Chan never returned. Her abduction triggered one of the largest manhunts in Australian history, known now as Operation Spectrum. It was a multi-million dollar undertaking that devoured tens of thousands of policeman hours alongside of many thousands more of volunteer hours. Sadly, Carmine would never be reunited with her family, not alive at least. Nearly one year after Carmine's abduction on April 9, 1992, a man walking his dog in the close-by area of Thompson Town happened upon a fully decomposed skeleton. This was eventually revealed to be Carmine Chan, who was shot three times in the head. Operation Spectrum continued for the next few years to search for Mr. Cruel. A 40-member task force investigated over 27,000 potential suspects, collected tens of thousands of tips from the public, and searched over 30,000 houses in the hopes of turning over a single clue. They never did. Spectrum was eventually shelved for good in 1994 and with it went any potential leads on the Mr. Cruel case. However, recently a major breakthrough had been made in the case. New details have suggested the suspect may have been linked to the city's electrical industry. Cutting-edge technology has created a map linking similarities between the abductions of three victims. His victims were all abducted near or found at electrical substations, leading investigators to believe the culprit had a connection in some way to the industry. This sketch shows what Mr. Cruel may have looked like. The pattern in his crimes often followed a period of surveillance of his victims before he would abduct and sexually assault the girls. Former criminal investigator Mike King told the program that connections suggest Mr. Cruel might have worked or posed as a substation employee or lived close by. This map from Cold Case Investigation shows the sites where Mr. Cruel attacked and abducted children where he released them, and where Carmine Chan's body was dumped. Shockingly, a witness told the program that in 1988, her brother saw a strange man filming one of his victims' homes six weeks before she was taken. The house backed onto a block of electrical towers. The woman who was friends and neighbors with the victim said someone would have had to know the area to be there. Another sketch of the abuser's room was made with the help of one of the victims. Because he was there so much, it's believed Mr. Cruel was seen by Carmine, which could be why he had to kill her. There are a lot of rumors about this case, but one thing is for sure, this is one of Australia's worst serial killers. Even the name given to the offender by the Melbourne newspaper has caused police problems. They say he is unlikely to seem cruel to those around him. It is possible Mr. Cruel stopped abducting children after Carmine's death. He may also be dead, in prison, or have moved on to a new killing field. What do you think happened to Mr. Cruel? Let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it and also share it with your friends. 
do check out some of our other videos, and make sure to subscribe to this channel for your regular dose of whodunits. See you in the next one. Until then, stay safe, stay warm, and don't get any crazy ideas.